Welcome uh, to this inaugural event of UCLAN's Research Centre for Field Archaeology and Forensic Taphonomy. This is a, a really exciting opportunity for us to, to take something that's the very heart of the centre, uh, the centre's ethos, which is interdisciplinarity and original data collection and field work. Uh, and then converting those into accessible stories that we can use to explore our identity and our past. This event will bring together the really important work of, of David Robinson and Eric Newsden to talk about uh, California, to talk about identity, to talk about uh, this, this huge amount of, of work that Dave's been doing over an entire lifetime of academic study. He's bringing interdisciplinary partners into this story uh, who bring all sorts of different perspectives from science and from 3D visualization to bring you a really cutting edge perspective on uh, this important community's past and their heritage. This is science, this is virtual storytelling all together in one, in one event. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Dave and, and Eric uh, in this in this event and I hope you really enjoy what we're about to produce. Dave if I hand over to you now. Thank you Duncan and I, I just want to say that the greatest pleasure I have working in California is being able to learn from the really the wisdom of the Native Americans who are in the landscapes that I that I work within and particularly with the members of the Tahon Indian tribe who uh, are an amazing, talented group of people who many of their ancestors uh, of which would be involved in the making of the archaeology we're going to be looking at. So it's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce Sandra Hernandez of the Tahon Indian tribe. And I've asked her to do a brief uh, introduction and, and maybe a welcome song for all of us here so that we can properly be in the right mode for the rest of the evening. So Sandra, if you could um, take it away, that would be fantastic. Hello, everybody. My name is Sandra Hernandez. I'm a Tohon tribal member here in Bakersfield, California. I'm happy to be here with everyone today. Um, I've been asked to kind of open with a California Indian song that I'm more than happy to share with all of you here today. Um, this song is a Tohon song sang out um, by our relatives. Um, it was told to us to learn this song, that it was a song that um, was sung whenever they were working, specifically whenever they were hanging meat. And um, in, in the song, we're talking about hang your meat up high because the dogs in the mountains are waiting and they're going to come you know, if you don't hang your meat up high. So um, it's something that for me, go, going back and looking at a song and then now reclaiming that song and re-singing it, it's really been for me an eye-opening experience to, to really try to apply that song in the same manner that our relatives did when we're working, when we're working hard, when we're trying to accomplish something. Um, with love and care for our family. So just offer all of you um, this song today. Oh, 
all my relations. Thank you all for that opportunity to share that with you. It's a joy and a pleasure to be able to sing that song, to hear it. Sometimes you can forget uh, what you have inside of you that's there waiting, and this song is always there waiting. So, again, a pleasure to share with all of you today. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was beautiful. And I just love that song. It's fantastic. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is maybe just get started into the event, and uh, I wanted to introduce people to a little bit about what the neighbors of your tribe, the Shumash, said about the, the sun. So if you just give me a moment. All the Tularenos sang the following song while a woman danced, holding three flint-pointed arrows behind her with both hands as a sign of peace. They called the song the stillness of the arrow. Courage, courage, now we are going to leave you. We are the sons of the sun. We continue, always triumphant. Under the shadow of the sun, all this assembly look. Fernando's grandfather told him that we say the sun is made this way or that. But all we have are our ideas. He said that he and others before him had tried to figure out how the sun was made. But how could they? They used to say that they had no idea as to who it was that created the sun. Sun is an old man. He is naked with a kukweli on his head, and he carries a firebrand in his hand. Sun is a widower. He lives alone with his pets and his two daughters who have never married. They have aprons made of live rattlesnakes. Narciso says, Never do anything that is prejudicial or unlawful and think that no one will see you. For while the sun is shining, an eye is there. And if it is night, Hutash will see. Some men will come and say that you have done it. The sun is the beauty of the world. It is born in the east, giving the world beautiful light. The morning and evening stars come first, then the dawn, and then the sun. The sun goes to rest in this hole of the sand dollar and leaves its rays outside while it rests inside. Kula'a told Fernando that if a man observed the virtues which belong to the rays of the sun, he would be like a ray in the world he would have noble feelings to help his neighbors. The real name of the sun was Kakukmukmawa. This was its metaphorical name and really meant the radiance of the child born on the 24th of December. So I just wanted to welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming here and spending your time with us. And this is an event called uh, Radiance of the Sun, Astronomy, Hallucinogens, and Rock Art from Native California. Um, but before I do anything, I'd like to introduce somebody who's a co-host with me. It's uh, Eric Knudsen, who is a professor of media practice at the University of Central Lancashire. And maybe, uh, Eric, you can say hi. Uh, hi, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dave. Uh, thank you very much for involving me in this project, which is a, a wonderful opportunity, I think, for transdisciplinary uh, research. So, of course, just as a reminder, you know, Dave works in archaeology as a reader uh, of archaeology at the University of Central Lancashire. And I'm a professor of media practice uh, at the University of Central Lancashire, and we've come together for elements of this project. So uh, hopefully some of that will become clearer as we as we go through the, uh, the evening. But it's been a wonderful opportunity to meet uh, Sandra and her family in California and to meet the other researchers that have been involved in this project. Project. And a little later on, um, I'll have a chance to introduce my colleague, uh, Yakovos uh, Panagopoulos, who uh, delivered some workshops in California as part of this project. So we're very much looking forward to this. So thank you very much, Dave. So, but we're do what we're doing this evening is we're exploring uh, astronomy and this very odd sort of combination that happens 
in the site that we're looking at, Pinwheel Cave, uh, hallucinogens. And all of this is occurring in a site that's located on the Windwolves Preserve in California, which is a, a absolutely um, beautiful, remarkable place um, that uh, I've had the pleasure of working at for over 20 years. And for me, Dave, you know, uh, when I came out in 2000, uh, 2017, I think it was, um, mm. what an amazing discovery for me. What an eye-opening experience to see the work that you're doing out there and to see, to, to open up to this new world of, of native California. And, and I'm just wondering, I mean, you started off with a video of the sun. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether you could say a little bit more about how native Californians thought of the sun and how, how it's different to perhaps how other people might be uh, thinking of, of the sun. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the the sun was a powerful entity. It was it was a person. And in our modern uh, Western mindset, these are sort of impersonal, just natural forces. And I, I did prepare a little bit of a of a slide, just a few slides, to situate people uh, in the landscape. Okay. So you know, we got a whole number of people who are going to be presenting, and so the audience will get to meet them a as we go along. But um, if you think about the the rock art that we're going to be looking at, the rock art also itself is, um, you can see them as being kind of persons. They're, they're representing uh, what I call transmorphic figures. So these are images that are painted that aren't so easily identifiable as a particular thing. So like if you look at the figure labeled G here, it's some sort of bird, but he has a very strange pinwheeling head. And if you look at figure H, could have looks like maybe a, a duck or a quail, but you know his arms are represented in different ways, and and so they're they're showing sort of these uh, collagic ways of 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 showing different types of forms, and just as the sun is this in that story is is an old man who has power. He's he's a he's a real person. He's not just an inert object. I think these uh, uh, rock art depictions are also representing the persona of some something in the mind of the audience of, of the of the ar artist that gets across an idea of something that's you know not just a picture but it's 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 about some real entity and this is the area that we're talking about it's over on the west coast of uh, north america in the united states in california and it's in the south central area of california if you head inland from Santa Bar uh, Barbara, you get to this area in the transverse ranges, and you got this huge, beautiful landscape called the Windmills Preserve. It's almost 100,000 acres of a contiguous landscape, and it's there for the preservation of uh, the beautiful land and, and, and the species that are threatened and endangered there. And it's an incredible place. But also, in, in contemporary and in past Native terms, it's this really interesting borderland area of different tribes. Lots of different tribes lived in this area. So the Shumash and uh, the Katanamuk and Sandra's one that's from the Katanamuk. But you had the Yokuts and you had the Tatavian. All kinds of different groups all lived in this area. So while oftentimes we refer to this site as uh, the area as being the Shumash, it, it was really about all those groups living in that area. So I kind of want to just, just get at that to let people know where we're talking about in the world. So now, now you've been to the preserve, Eric. Um, yeah, I have. And and but, we were talking a little earlier about about the cave itself. Yes, I mean I haven't been to the actual pinwheel cave, which I think is what you're going to be talking about more specifically this evening. But I I went to the Plato caves, mm. and I have to say I saw some of these paintings, and I, it's just absolutely magnificent and awe inspiring. And then to that very dangerous climb up to the cave, and then the vistas. Yes. And I can, yes. I can, you, you know, you lie in that cave, and I think Devlin was there when I when I went uh, on on the visit there, and it's absolutely amazing. So I'm I'm looking forward to hear more about the pinwheel project in 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 particular, and then I also went to the cash caves, mm, which I yeah. think you've been working on uh, on as well. Yeah. So uh, wonderful experience. And I think wonderful opportunities, I think, as we have been doing, try and engage with some of the stories that lie behind 
the artwork and your finds, and it's a wonderful opportunity to try and connect the, the science of archaeology with the culture and the history of what happened in these landscapes. So um, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to look more closely at those connections. Okay, well, maybe what I could do is I could show, again, a little video that shows the site itself. And, and also, because one of the things that we're talking about we've been, is, is the, uh, this idea that the power of the sun, uh, this particular site, Pinwell Cave, has interactions with the sun. So I'll, I'll introduce the, the, the site and we'll talk a little bit about how the sun operates there just to get us into this, uh, into the mode. Okay, so as the sun sets on the 21st of June or thereabouts, the, this light starts coming into the cave. And, and I, I did show this in that original video uh, about the sun. And so it it's moves quite slowly. I've speeded up this film by 600 times. So it's actually moving 600 times faster than it does in reality. But as it gets lower, the light starts to wake across the surface. And so it starts picking up speed. And so here you can see it. The light's moving along. And, you know, this is Devlin's fantastic photography that I'm showing here. And... So it's heading right towards this incredible pinwheel painting uh, that you can see in the back of the, the wall. And this is uh, about 35 by 24 centimeters or 13 by nine inches. And it's painted in this red ochre. And it's, it's, it's really a curious thing. Why do we have this light entering the cave heading towards this particular painting? And so that's one of the things that really started us off on this project is is to think about what's going on with the uh, with the paintings there. Um, but also, I wanted to show you something. Then, what got me into the whole project in the first place was uh, we wanted to uh, do some work there to try and see uh, what was actually happening at the site in terms of uh, uh, were these hidden sites or were they public sites. Um, what's actually happening uh, in the site. So uh, I was able to get some really old footage that's provided to me by um, Kate Jopling, who was a master's student at Bristol back in 2007 when we did the excavations. And so um, I've been able to use some of her material and share that with you today. This gives you a better sense for the site. You can see there's these boulders that are right there in the tree line. Those boulders have these bedrock mortars where food is being processed. But that's not the actual cave itself. You go across this big grassy plain and you can see, you know, the uh, uh, all the oak trees in this region. You get higher, you got pine trees, uh, there's juniper that's available. So all these trees provide great resources for the traditional Native Californians when they live there. And this, these rocks that you can see just emerging from the oak trees, that's, that's where the, the rock art is. And this is Pinwheel Cave. And again, this is some of the great work that uh, Josh Roth and Colin Rosemont and Devlin Gandhi have done with their videography of the site. But we've also laser scanned the site. So James Miles of Archaeovision did this work. And uh, you can see that the rock is really rough. It's got all these porous little cavities and there's crevices all over the place. It's a mud flow breccia, so sort of a volcanic mud flow that formed in these big clumps and erodes quite easily. But there's little apertures and gaps that you can see. And if you start to move into the, these, basically these boulders, you can enter into the space of the main cave itself. So now we're inside the cave. And there's a few of these old balls that are around there are just for the laser scanner to orient itself. But as we move back through the cave, you can see the, the pinwheel is hanging out there at the back of the, of the cave. And this would be the, the, the east part of the cave or the west facing pinwheel. Really interested in is how the rock art relates to uh, what people did around the rock art. And how does the rock art relate to society? How does rock art relate to different tasks that people did around the rock art? One of the things that's very interesting about Pinwheel Cave is there's quite a separation between any apparent activity and the art itself. And if you look in the far distance along the horizon line, you'll see a line of bumpy rocks uh, right where the oak trees are. Now that's a, a bedrock mortar complex, a BRM complex. 
but this cave's kind of far away. Even though they can see the, the cave, it's still separated. So it appears to be one of these special places hidden away in private. And one of the questions that we want to uh, address in the excavations is to see what kind of activities occurred here so that we can see if it really was truly a hidden special place. We're just setting up the excavation. Uh, we have a one by one meter unit. We're trying to find uh, pigment that's in the deposits. Hopefully we can date those deposits and then that way we'll know when the art was made because we think people must have been sitting here or if the, uh, if the original surface was lower, they were standing here and some of their pigment may have ended up in the deposits. So I want to talk a little bit too about what we found during the excavations. Here you can see some of the excavations occurring, uh, but we found lots of these lithics, these stone tools, including uh, arrowheads and this thing called an arrow shaft straightener. Franciscan shirt would indicate trade with the people from San Inez Valley region or the San Rafael Mountains. And we found evidence of storage and food processing, found bits of pottery in there, which indicates that they're probably potentially cooking or uh, at least storing materials. We found what's this, this base for a, uh, was a basket and also these tarring pebbles, which were used for waterproofing. You know, this is, this is indicating the latest period in prehistory. I mean, I think it's just a flat piece of sandstone. I don't think it's really been purposely abraded. And also we did find bits of pigment in the excavations. And these were analyzed and of course they turned out to be an ochre, a red ochre or a hematite. But also we found beads, lots of beads, extreme quantity of beads. Uh, that really showed the site was uh, being utilized quite extensively. They're, the whole sophistication that they had previously in making olabella beads just went by the wayside. And of course, we found direct evidence of cooking uh, and, and probably eating as well. Found lots amounts of charcoal, well, more charcoal than any site that we've ever excavated, uh, probably because of the preservation, but tons of fragmented bone that was. I think that's what's so interesting about some of the archaeological materials that they've been finding is that a lot of it is sort of um, inside and outside of the cave, um, not so far away, is sort of just everyday remains of you know eating and living. Uh, and so it makes it uh, quite a different story about what was going on there and what sort of people might have been using the cave or um, or even just sort of seeking it out as a, a special place for a variety of reasons. Okay, well, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what was going on with the excavations and the kind of material that we found. And it also gives you a sense for the, uh, the actual space itself. So, of course, as we excavate, uh, this material then gets uh, an analyzed by different experts. And so um, one of the experts that uh, worked on our material uh, was uh, Christina Gill, and she is a California archaeobotanical expert. She's done work uh, all over, particularly the um, South Central California region. Uh, and she uh, looked at some of the uh, macrobotanical remains uh, that we uh, re recovered from the cave. And so um, she's prepared a presentation, and I'll play that presentation for her and uh, for everybody, and, and hopefully we will be able to talk to her a little bit about, about her work uh, after this. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the macrobotanical remains that were recovered from Pinwheel Cave, um, specifically not the botanical remains that uh, were associated with the quids that came out of the, the roof of the the cave itself, but um, carbonized plant remains that came out of the site excavations. I looked at materials from both the bedrock mortar complex and from the cave itself. Samples were taken from inside the cave, right at the entrance, and then just outside of the cave. Um, and then we also did an off-site control sample as well. 
uh, to confirm that the carbonized plant remains that we were recovering um, were in fact cultural. Uh, the methods associated with uh, this type of work, very briefly, um, the each soil sample was processed using a flotation machine, the Floatec flotation machine. And what this does is it separates the carbonized material that uh, floats to the surface from the rest of the, the rocks and um, other material in the soil. Um, once the material is captured in the uh, 0.4 millimeter mesh, it's hung up to dry. And after it's dried, it's size, size sorted. And then I look at it through a dissecting microscope. Um, identifications were made to the lowest taxonomic category possible. Um, and this was done using my own personal uh, comparative collection. Um, and then I also consulted with uh, the USDA Seed Laboratory in Sacramento and Dr. Eric Wolgamoth of Far Western. The identified plant taxa from these midden contexts um, was, was pretty diverse, a uh, diverse array of, of plant foods being processed and consumed at these sites. Nuts, fruits, and seeds were all used, including acorn, um, juniper, elderberry, making up the fruits. Um, and then the small seeds, grasses, phacelia, and chia dominated. And there were another, a number of other uh, seeds as well that I haven't listed here. Acorn makes up a total of about 27% of the entire assemblage. Uh, the fruits, including the juniper and elderberry, make up a much smaller proportion overall. And the uh, majority of, of plant remains um, include the small seeds, about 72%. And of those, uh, grasses made up about 74% of the small seed assemblage in the cave. And there were at least four different types of grasses um, identified, including hair grass, which is pitch, pictured here, um, wild barley, bluegrass, and fescue, which is interesting. Um, there was also quite a diverse array of basketry taxa that were identified. These were all identified from the seeds, um, and those include Indian rush, cattail, pondweed, tule, and alkali sacaton. Um, the Cattail um, and tulies were used in a wide variety of, of weaving um, and basketry making, including uh, weaving houses. Um, tule was the primary um, plant used for that. Um, Indian rush was used for a lot of um, finer basketry uh, work. And all of these uh, basketry taxa are edible. The seeds are edible. Um, in particular, cattail and tule have edible roots. Um, but it, it seems like it's more likely that they were used uh, for basketry at this location. Archaeo botanical remains from uh, general midden contexts can tell us a lot about the environment and seasonality. Um, all the taxa recovered here primarily occur in grassland and oak woodland uh, habitat types. Um, and at Pinwheel Cave, we had 7.8% of the identified tax that come from wetland plant communities. And this is consistent with what we see in the area today where the sites are situated um, generally in an oak woodland and open grassland um, community mosaic and uh, located near a spring. There's a spring situated right in between the bedrock mortar complex and Pinwheel Cave itself. There's also extensive wetlands um, found in, on the floor of the Southern San Joaquin Valley below uh, when, when lake systems uh, were more extensive than, than we find today. As far as seasonality goes, um, indicating which seasons these sites might have been occupied or used, um, there are multiple seasons represented by the, the plant taxa recovered here. But there's a strong, the strongest argument for a fall occupation based on these remains, um, specifically the presence of acorn, juniper, and then a lot of the late ripening seeds. Um, grasses are late summer ripening. Um, chia um, and phacelia are all taxa that ripen later in the summer. 
Um, and then, you know, the the basketry material itself, um, it could technically be harvested at any time of the year. Um, but the the native people that I've talked to um, that are really uh, the weavers that I've talked to that, that uh, harvest um, weaving materials on a regular basis um, have all told me that that mostly likely occurred in the fall um, after nesting season. There's a lot of uh, birds that use uh, tulies and and cattail marshes for nesting during the summer. So typically. Um, these uh, materials would be harvested uh, after that. So it seems like a fall harvest or a fall occupation uh, use of this site is uh, strongest supported. So in summary, um, the archibotanical remains from these midden contexts, um, they indicate a clear domestic function at each of these uh, locations where subsistence activities uh, were taking place, um, the consumption, preparation of food. Uh, the cave may also have been used as a place to store or prepare basketry materials. Um, and interestingly, no seeds or other morphologically identifiable fragments of datura or other psychotropic plants like tobacco were recovered um, in, in the general midden context. And I, I think it's really interesting to, to see the, the juxtaposition of the other material that was found um, at, at the cave, um, especially the datura quids, um, in such a close context with this um, area that is clearly domestic from a regular archibotanical analysis. It's very interesting. So thank you uh, for inviting me to be a part of this project, um, especially Dave and Fraser. Um, it's been an interesting, um, interesting journey and I appreciate being a part of it. Thank you. Wonderful, I, is, is Christina here? I just had a quick question. Yeah, I'm here, but for some reason my video is not working. Okay. Christina, for a lay person like me, does your work involve any kind of establishing of time scales? I mean, are you able to date any of these samples and 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 kind of put a time scale to these developments from your work? Yes, uh, that's definitely possible. A lot of the seeds that were recovered are are pretty small, which is difficult to date directly. Um, so for this project, we were relying mostly on uh, the other. Uh, other radiocarbon dated contexts for this, but generally, yes. Plus the beans. Well, can yes. you give us a sense of what periods we're talking about? I think this is, I mean, late, late period. Um, Dave could probably uh, provide some more context with that, but yeah, generally uh, later in time period, closer to um, European contact. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so you very much, Christina. And and Dave, I mentioned I, I I heard Christina mentioning the word quids and that they yeah. they existed in pinwheel. C could you could you say a little bit about? I mean, first of all, for somebody like me, I mean, what I know everybody probably knows what quids are, but <laughs> perhaps you could just quickly explain what quids are and what the significance the these quids are in relation to the pinwheel cave. Yeah. Well, um, the well, first of all, the site does like it's just as what. Um, Christina is saying the site dates to uh, what's called the late period in California, which uh, the the earliest dates we have from the cave are about 1500 AD. Um, so that that's still considered prehistory because um, uh, that's what's oh. thought of in, in California. Um, and Europeans don't really show up in California. Um, there, there's there's incursions that occur, but they don't really uh, start settling in California until uh, the late 1700s. Um, and then in this region uh, later into into the, the early 1800s. So um, so and we have evidence from that time period from about 1500 AD all the way through. So we get we get beads that were made during during uh, colonial periods and all the way up to uh, the late 1800s, 1860s, 1870s. So um, so Sandra and I have talked before how this dates right to the to the time period of uh some of her uh ancestors who left written records so um so she's she's she knows a lot about this region and, and a lot about the people who uh, lived around there 
Um, but yeah, these quids, quids are basically, they're things that you, you put in your mouth, uh, you, fibrous materials, um, uh, in modern terms, like tobacco, people who chew tobacco, they, they pack it in, in between your, your gums and their, and their, um, and their cheek and they kind of ch chomp on it and get the juices out and you spit out bits. Uh, those, those bits you spit out are called quids. And for, uh, uh, native peoples all over the Americas, uh, they would do the same thing oftentimes with uh, with plant materials that were too tough to eat and swallow, but you would extract the nutrients out of it. So, and, and there are really there are pack, little packs of, of fibrous materials that you spit out, and then you know you when archaeologists go and look at these sites, they find these little uh, these little packed remnants of these quids. And so um, this site had some of these quids. But unlike the other sites that are found in the cave deposits, they're shoved up in little crevices, which was extremely odd. So, um, so maybe I could introduce you to a little bit to the to the quids. Here is the namesake of the cave. This is the pinwheel, and we think that perhaps this might represent the opening flowers of Datura. Perhaps this representation of a trance-inducing plant may be related to the substances we find crammed into the porous cracks in the ceilings around the cave. So here in Pinwheel, there have been bundles of um, vegetation and fibrous material found within the holes up here. There is a question over what they are, and we do not know what they are at the moment, but one of the theories is that they are chews or quids that have been packaged together because they are important or special to the um, Chumash tribe that were used in this cave. An interesting question would be whether these um, chews or quids contain the Torah. The Torah has plant alkaloids in it which can produce a hallucinogenic effect. The technique that I'm going to use to do this is chromatography combined with mass spectrometry. So chromatography, quite simply, um, separates molecules. So all the molecules and the different molecules in this complex mixture within the quid are pushed through a column. The different chemicals interact with the wall of the column for different amounts of time. Because they're interacting for different amounts of times, some of the molecules are bound for longer than other molecules, and this causes them to be separated as they flow down the column. So we're taking a complex mixture at the top and we're splitting it out into its parts throughout the column. This then exits the bottom of the column and we quite simply weigh them via a mass spectrometric technique in order to find out what the molecules are. We're able to also fragment these molecules and molecules fragment in a very specific manner. They fragment into the different jigsaw pieces and we can then piece back these jigsaw pieces to work out what the molecule is. And this will enable us to determine what are the components of these quids and what they may have been used for. Okay, so that's a... Uh... Matt Baker, who couldn't be here today, uh, but he's part of uh, an amazing group of um, of uh, chemists in uh, the University of Strathclyde, who uh, became curious about the the quids along with me, and and so Datura is a plant that has um, uh, different psychotropic uh, hallucinogenic um, compounds, uh, including scopolamine and atropine, and um, so um, the Strathclyde team um, said that they may be able to actually identify those compounds, which would help us then determine whether or not these these quids, which are shoved up into the ceiling, unlike being found in the the, the, the normal deposits in in uh, on the ground that uh, normally you would find quids, that could potentially uh, show if they're uh, if they're detura. And if they are detura, then that might then support this idea that 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 opening of the flowers of of the Tura is indeed what that pinball painting was all about. So, um, is the so potential, Dave, that the people were hanging out, having a good time, getting stoned, watching the sun set? Yeah, I mean, um, that's one way of looking at it. But another way of looking <laughs> at it is that it's far more laden with meaning rather than saying that they were getting stoned and having a good time. Uh, because Datura is an extremely dangerous um, um, plant to get into a relationship with. And so um, it, it, it has the other compounds which can be deadly. It's, it's known as deadly nightshade. So uh, it's not something to be toyed with. And we in no way do we recommend that anybody ever give a go <laughs> to, to Datura. Um, the native Californians knew how to deal with the powers of Datura. 
Um, but the team in Strathclyde also have this uh, great ability to deal with the powers of Datura. So I want to introduce um, Lynn uh, Denany, who is the senior lecturer in pure and applied chemistry at the University of Strathclyde. And she was uh, part of the, the team that really did this uh, scientific look at these these quids to try and determine uh, what they were. To identify if the quids did in fact contain the hallucinogenic Datura plant, chemical analysis of their composition was performed. To do this, 100 mg of each quid was separated out for extraction. This small sample was then added to 10 mL of methanol as an extraction solvent. To perform extraction, each sample was ultrasonicated for 40 minutes, after which it was pre-concentrated via solvent evaporation down to a final volume of 3 mL. 1 mL of the pre-concentrate was then filtered to remove any remaining solid particulates and sent for analysis via liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry or LCMS for short. Reverse phase chromatography was used, which consists of a polar mobile phase and non-polar stationary phase combination. To gain our polar mobile phase, we used a combination of formic acid and water and acetonitrile, and for our non-polar stationary phase, a C18 column was used. A dual detection system was used, comprising of UV analysis at a set wavelength of 214 nanometers and mass spectrometry. Mass spec measures the resulting ion patterns from a present compound. These ions are characteristic to the compound contained within the sample and thus can be used for the confident chemical identification of an unknown substance. After the ions are produced, they're separated by the mass analyzer based on their mass to charge ratios. Recording these mass to charge ratios allows for the construction of the final mass spectrum output. To identify atropine and scopolamine, their pseudomolecular ions were used. These are found at values equal to their mass plus 1 to account for the hydrogen atom. Therefore, for atropine, we are looking for a mass to charge ratio of 290, and for scopolamine, we're looking for 304. Each quid extract was analysed by LCMS, and atropine and scopolamine were positively identified through the extraction of the 290 and 304 ions from the resultant total ion chromatogram. With atropine and scopolamine confidently identified with an all quid samples, it could be confidently determined that the quids did likely contain the hallucinogenic Datura plant. The Datura plant is known to contain both tropane alkaloids of atropine and scopolamine in all parts of its plant material, and therefore, although we're not sure what the quids comprise of, it is likely that they do contain in some part this plant. So that was a pretty incredible finding from the Strathclyde team. Um, so er Eric, um, so I'm always just curious from um, uh, from a non-archaeologist point of view, um, uh, how is how is it assimilating all this sort of heavy-duty science um, from your perspective? Oh no, it's absolutely it's absolutely fascinating, uh, Dave, because you know it's a great opportunity for us storytellers to you know uh, you'll you'll see from my question to you before about the quids my imagination immediately goes into into overdrive and perhaps it shows the difference in 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 emphasis of methodologies that really you have to you have to follow the the evidence mm. and and have to be careful about speculating and 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 so on but um uh, it's 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 really interesting to hear, you know, from your perspective, following that evidence, what it is you're finding and, and, and the kind of issues that this might raise. So very interesting. Maybe you could explain a little bit of uh, about how you were able to identify the scop scopolamine and atropine. Yeah, sure, of course. So, I mean, obviously it's a plant material and a dried plant material, which did create problems for us because we can't inject this onto our um, instruments. Basically, what will happen is... Um, you would clog the instruments and you not do any analysis. So that was the first step in our, our approach is that we had to extract out all the chemicals from that dried plant material. And we did that by sonicating it in an organic solvent. So this just helps the chemicals come out so that um, we can then analyze them, inject them into our chromatography. And as Matt Baker explained, we basically use the different interactions on the wall of the, of the column to separate out the different individual um, compounds that are there. And once we separate them all out, we then can use 
um, spectroscopy, in this case mass spectrometry, which looks at the weight of the different samples and how it fragments. And based on that, we can piece together what the compound is. So in the video, you'll see that we have the structure of both atropine and scopolamine, which mm. are both um, hallucinogens. And based on our analysis, we could separate them out and know, compare against standards that they gave the same chromographic, chromatography, so they stayed on the column for the same length of time. So we knew that confirmed it. But to even be more positive, we could then look at their actual weights using the mass spectrometry to actually say, yes, this is in fact scopolamine. And so we tested all our different samples multiple times, comparing against standards. And there was just, uh, so we could use that to then show that they contained both scopolamine and atropine so both were present and both were from that tutorial so we showed that these quids did in fact have um or at least had components of the hallucinogen and um, from the tutorial plant and, and isn't it amazing that it, you know some of these are 500 years old that that the compounds are still there i know i think we were absolutely shocked we were we were pretty hesitant to begin with to to think that there might be still some of these left or we wouldn't get breakdown products or degradation products like over time it just degraded but no in fact we did see small amounts but still enough that we could see them quite clearly so that was a very impressive and i think we were all a little bit shocked overwhelmed and, and excited that we could manage to see them as well cool cool um well you know eric so we also would not only uh, do we use the quids to try and analyze to find out if they're datura uh, but we use other methods um, that so, so a lot of this stuff has yes. already been published in in a publication that came out recently in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, but we continue to do work, and so we've done we've done more work uh, besides that. Yeah, and I think you want, you wanted to introduce the uh, yes, next I, I understand Anna Herke. I hope I've pronounced it correctly. Herke uh, from the French National Center for Re 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 uh, Scientific Research is going to talk. Uh, a bit more about the kind of pollen aspect of of quids, which I suppose is different from the chemical compound. So welcome, Anna. Um, Th uh, thank you, thank you, Eric and, and Dave, to to inviting me to participate in this event, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you and to listen all this fantastic research that uh, has been done in in pinwheel. So I'm going to explain you the, what I got from the pollen analysis of the Datura quids at uh, Pinwheel Cave. And, um, well, the analysis of fossil pollen, that it's the reproductive particles of plants, has never been applied to the study of archaeological quids. And this study uh, was done to explore the use of plants and flowers in the making and consumption of the quids, and also to obtain information on the season where when kids were uh, gathered, um, made and consumed. Sources of pollen deposition in the quids are multiple and can have a natural and anthropogenic origin. Um, for instance, uh, natural pollen uh, rain accumulates into the aerial parts of the datura plants while gathering or also uh, during storage when uh, the plant is exposed into the open air. Um, but we also need to consider anthropogenic uh, pollen inputs, such as, for instance, the intentional addition of flowers or plants into the quids. Um, finally, we need to consider two post depositional pollen inputs that uh, is pollen that come from that it's transported into the cave uh, uh, with the air and that is deposited in the outer surface of the quids once they were uh, deposited into the cave saline. In order to rule out this post-depositional pollen input, we have uh, peeled off the exterior surface of the, of the quids before analyzing to make sure that our pollen signal uh, comes from the inside of the quid. Uh, we have studied two different types of sample for individual uh, quids uh, that you have here in the lower part of the diagram. Uh, these are individual kits that were located in different areas of the cave. And also we analyzed it three, three quids that were packed together in a package of quids uh, that had other, many other quids, uh, not only these three, but uh, I analyzed only um, these 
three samples. So this came from the quit two package. Pollen preservation and diversity was excellent in all the quits analyzed, and the pollen assemblage is dominated by wind dispersed pollen taxa, mainly shrubs from the sunflower and goosefoot families, and also grasses that represent over a 40% of the, of the pollen uh, spectra. Also, the main tree pollen taxa is oak, and well, these are all plants that are currently growing in the, in the cave environment and their presence in the quids can easily be, be displayed by uh, natural deposition through the exposure of the quids to the natural pollen rain. But we also found an unusual pollen signal in the quid package, in the, in the different quids that came from this package of multiple quids, that it's high percentages and concentrations of Lomatium pollen. Lomatium is an insect pollinated plant from the carrot family that has a very low pollen production and dispersal. So these high percentages and concentrations of Lomatium pollen cannot be explained merely with, uh, by the, the, the natural uh, pollen inputs. Also, we documented fragments of anthers with adhered lomatium pollen grains, which indicates the presence of lomatium flowers in the quids. Several species of lomatium grow in the San Emilio Hills in a slope scrubs and woodland habitats. This was an important plant resource for shumas and other native communities who use Lomatium species for food, ritual, and medicinal purposes. Um, perhaps the, the most known was uh, Lomatium californicum, also known as Chuchupate, that it's the one that you have here in the, in the picture. But they use many other species of Lomatium. For instance, there is ethnographic information that the Cabaisu that live in the neighboring Tehachapi mountains, boiled and eat the flowers of the foothill Lomatium. Uh, the fact that the Lomatium flowers are present in a very specific context, that it's the package of multiple quids and it's absent from the individual kids, can suggest a different or a specific use for the quids within this package. For instance, an hypothesis could be the use of these quids for the preparation of herbal drinks. Datura drinks were used uh, in a specific youth passage rituals, and perhaps other plants such as Lomatium could have been added. Um, as for seasonality, uh, that is the season where uh, the, the datura was gathered and the quids were made and consumed. If we consider the pollen taxa that uh, is recorded, is documented in the quids, um, it seems more likely uh, the period between March and June, with May and June being the months of maximum coincidence of blooming taxa. However, we need to consider that datura and other plants could have been gathered during the late winter or spring and stocked and consumed later in the summer. In that case, uh, pollen argues for a consumption not later than August, because this is when most documented taxa stop blooming. So this is what I wanted to explain to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Can I squeeze in a quick question, Dave? Yeah, please do. From a from a lay person again, a lay question to both Christina and to Anna. If if quids were chewed, does that mean that there's potentially uh, human DNA to be found as well? Normally, yes, but uh, it depends if it has preserved. The DNA. I think, Dave, uh, you have tried not to to identify DNA. Yeah, th that was one of the first things we tried, and we sent it to four or five different labs, and it never worked. And they said that there's inhibitors in there, uh, which they called gunk, <laughs> which prevented them being able to actually uh, not only just they couldn't extract any DNA whatsoever, so they couldn't identify the plant species or anything like that. 